In 23 BC, as part of a discreet plan to retrieve Rome's captured standards from King Phraates of Parthia, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa was appointed governor of Syria. From the island of Lesbos, Agrippa quietly negotiated with Parthian ambassadors until a satisfactory arrangement was finally struck. Rome's military standards would be presented to Caesar Augustus in a public ceremony at an historic meeting along the Euphrates River, to be scheduled two years later. But the Parthian ambassadors were not the only people to visit Marcus Agrippa on the island of Lesbos. Herod the Great, the Idumean king placed upon Judea's throne by Marcus Antonius, also journeyed to the island to meet with Marcus Agrippa. Wishing to express his gratitude to Caesar Augustus for allowing him to keep his throne in spite of having been the loyal client king of Marcus Antonius, King Herod sought to build and dedicate to Augustus a city in Judea so glorious as to be worthy of the name Caesar. The city would be created by renovating and updating the old Phoenician settlement known as Straton's Tower and would be called Caesarea Maritima. Herod envisioned Caesarea as an eastern metropolis that would be in accordance with the cosmopolitan development that characterized Rome's constant expansion under Caesar Augustus and Marcus Agrippa. Like Rome, Caesarea would host an enormous amphitheater as well as a hippodrome so large that 20,000 spectators could enjoy chariot races or any other spectacle designed for mass entertainment. Fresh water would be carried into the city via Roman aqueducts. But the crowning glory of Herod's vision for Caesarea was to be an all-weather artificial harbor, which he hoped to construct along Judea's coastline, a flat coastline which boasted neither peninsula nor islands to facilitate the difficult construction project. But the building of such a city and port required the approval of Caesar Augustus himself, or his second-in-command, Marcus Agrippa lest such an ambitious building project be viewed as a challenge to Roman authority. Rome already had a massive port near the city of Antioch in Syria, called Seleucia Peria. This port not only served the commercial trade industry, but also played host to Rome's naval fleets stationed along the eastern Mediterranean Sea. And in Egypt, trade vessels and grain clippers were launched and received in countless numbers from the great harbour of Alexandria all beneath the watchful eye of the pharaoh's lighthouse. Where then was the necessity for Judea to construct a competing harbour of such proportions between Syria and the city of Alexandria? And given Alexandria was the personal property of Caesar Augustus, where was the wisdom? Unfortunately, we do not know what was discussed between King Herod and Marcus Agrippa in 23 BC. But we do know that the city of Caesarea Maritima along with its impossible harbour, was nearly complete by the time Marcus Agrippa left Rome with his wife Julia in 17 BC. King Herod named the new harbour Sebastos, the Greek word for Augustus. Although there is no historical evidence that Marcus Agrippa sanctioned the building of such an enormous harbour in Judea, interestingly, the Sebastos shared some unusual characteristics with the Portus Julius a secret naval harbour built by Agrippa in 37 BC. The harbour at Caesarea Maritima was constructed with the same building materials used to construct Agrippa's secret port. Called hydraulic concrete, these building materials used a mixture of volcanic tuff and other powdery resins, which cured and hardened once they came into contact with the water, making them perfect for constructing a harbour's underwater foundations. The Romans had been building with hydraulic concrete for more than a hundred years, having discovered an endless resource of the tuff in the volcanic regions that surrounded Naples in Italy. But Judea, as well as her surrounding lands, experienced little to no volcanic activity. Tuff had to be imported from Italy. It is possible that Agrippa, by rights of his legal authority as emperor in the east, approved the transportation of Campanian tuff aboard Rome's grain clippers and other merchant vessels to Sebastos, where they would deliver the necessary building materials, then continue their voyages to Alexandria, maintaining the balance of their vessels with ballasts filled with debris from Caesarea. But what might have driven Agrippa to implement such an unlikely project? 
the Battle of Cary in 53 BC, and Marcus Antonius's failure at Media Atropatine in 36 BC had proven to Augustus that the Parthians were formidable. And despite reaching an uneasy peace between Rome and Parthia in 23 BC, Parthian raids and incursions into Syrian territory continued, unofficially. The building of the Sebastos Harbour may have served to give the Romans an alternate military presence in the east, with the ability to more effectively protect Rome's domain. The Sebastos might also have functioned as a station for a secondary naval force, far from the tempting lifestyle of the seductive east. Such a harbour could also provide a port in the storm for grain clippers and merchant ships suddenly tossed about by a violent sea. Yet it should also be noted that when Marcus Agrippa met with King Herod on Lesbos, there was concerning division within the legions, who objected to Caesar Augustus's obvious favoritism of his nephew Marcellus as their next commander. Although historical details are vague as to what exactly was going on in the East under the administration of Marcus Agrippa, it is a solid fact that in 14 BC, Marcus Agrippa, the second man in Rome, summoned King Herod to Sinope on the northern coast of Anatolia. Agrippa was fighting to regain control of Crimea, where rebellion had broken out, and had commanded the Judean king to sail his new naval fleet to the Black Sea. King Herod, who would not have built a navy without Roman authority, complied, quickly setting out from Caesarea. Along the way, Anatolian satraps and other client kings begged him to intercede on their behalf, as they had inadvertently incurred the wrath of Marcus Agrippa. Agrippa's wife, Julia, had undertaken a sightseeing expedition to the abandoned ruins of Ilium, believed to be the site of the ancient city of Troy. While exploring the site of the famed Trojan War by boat, a sudden storm arose, bringing with it a flash flood. Julia, who could not swim, was thrown from the boat and nearly drowned before being rescued by onlookers. When Julia returned to her husband and told him about her ordeal, Agrippa became so enraged that he fined the local town 100,000 drachmae for almost killing his wife. But the towns around the ancient site of Ilium were poverty-stricken, and none could pay such a costly and unfair fine. When King Herod arrived in Sinope, he succeeded in appeasing the wrath of Marcus Agrippa, likely convincing the general that the citizens of Ilium had no control over the weather, while also reminding him that it was those same citizens who had endangered their own lives to rescue Julia. Marcus Agrippa dropped the fine altogether thus freeing the locals from devastation and ruin. With their naval maneuvers on the Black Sea concluded, King Herod then journeyed with Marcus Agrippa as their forces made their way back through Anatolia. En route, King Herod made himself indispensable to Agrippa, acting as a confidant, counselor, partner, and even his friend. King Herod, who had a very good working relationship with both Caesar Augustus and Marcus Agrippa, acted as Rome's representative to many of the eastern city-states along the way, addressing complaints and concerns. Also, by acting as a spokesman for the Jews of Anatolia, Herod's diplomacy established him as the symbolic king of the Jews, resulting in his representation of even those Jewish communities living beyond the borders of his kingdom. In return for Herod's role in helping to persuade the Jewish communities of Anatolia, as well as satrapies and client kingdoms, that Roman expansion benefited them, Marcus Agrippa confirmed the right of the Jews of the East, as well as those in Judea, to continue in their religious observances without interference or ill-treatment from Rome, a confirmation for which King Herod, who had also undertaken the restoration of Jerusalem's temple, was eternally grateful. By winning much respect within the Anatolian provinces and city-states, succeeding as a gracious ambassador to the Jewish population of the East as a whole, and by assisting in returning the Black Sea's Crimean Peninsula to Roman control, King Herod had demonstrated great loyalty to Rome, and had secured an enduring relationship with Marcus Agrippa. It could not have escaped King Herod that Caesar, who had stripped Agrippa of both his sons, now sat in Rome, while Agrippa sat in the East. 
likely reflecting on earlier days when the Roman Empire had seen division between Caesar Augustus and Marcus Antonius, King Herod bade goodbye to his good friend Agrippa. He could only hope that, should war break out between the two emperors, King Herod's ally, the second man in Rome, would very soon become the first man in Rome.